Robert Langan from the National Cryptologic Foundation, and I'm here with my colleague, uh, Christine Harding. If you have questions, Q&A is a great spot. That way we don't crowd up the, the chat to put those questions, and she's and I are going to help monitor the chat and the Q&A. So we'll interrupt maybe if the question is appropriate, we'll interrupt our speaker. But She's left lots of time for questions at the end. So we will have time at the end to answer all your questions, but you can still put them in there and we can ask them to her at the end. So today, the name of our chat is the path to data privacy starts with data care. And what we're trying to say is we can't feel empowered that we are protected and our, all our data is private unless we have the skill to take care of that data. And so we're here to talk about what data is, how we can protect it, why we should bother protecting it. And to help us all be better moving forward today is uh, Cindy Gula. And she is managing partner for Gula Tech Adventures, which focuses on cyber technology, cyber policy, recruiting more people to join the cyber workforce, which is uh, so needed. So welcome, Cindy. We're excited to have you chat with us today. Well, thanks so much for having me. I, uh, I am so excited to be here. As Jennifer stated, I am passionate uh, about the cyber industry. And it's not because I was attracted to it. I, my degree is not in computer science. It is not in anything with computers. When I was younger, computers were boring. I didn't want to have access to them. It seemed hard. But I did become an engineer. And just through osmosis, I have been able to get into the cybersecurity field. And so just my background, like I said, I was an engineer. My husband and I started a cybersecurity company in 1998. It was an intrusion detection system. And we sold that company. And then we started a second company in uh, 2000. And that one is Tenable Network Security. Some of you may be familiar with the Nessus Vulnerability Scanner, uh, which is the most popular world's uh, most popular vulnerability scanner that helps and really enables companies and people, personal and beyond, to practice what we consider cyber hygiene. Similar to the pandemic, where we all learn that it's really good to wash our hands and wear masks and protect ourselves, we became a lot more aware of how we'd interact with each other on a physical basis that also could translate into the digital domain. We are connected digitally when we text each other, when we email each other. So we really should learn and continue to practice cyber hygiene. And it does seem like the words, very sterile, not interesting. What I can tell you being, coming into this industry, not thinking I was in this industry, when I realized the, that I actually landed solidly into it. I want more people in this industry because the reality is y'all are anyway, you just might not know it. So I really would like to take some time to look over this idea of data. What, it, what does data mean? Data privacy? Is there an expectation of this privacy? But in general, the secondary term of cybersecurity Cybersecurity beyond anything else sounds Herculean, and it, it does not invite people in a natural, comfortable way to come in. So I have a presentation, so I just want to start sharing my screen here. So we're seeing the great power at our fingertips, utilizing technology and creating new mindsets regarding computers and the potential use of the Internet. There have been so many advances, including computers in our hands, streaming movies, and having food delivered to our doors. Most people's minds have been blown trying to wrap their heads around the capabilities and the cap capacity of what we have in front of us. So much convenience, such fast connectivity. How do we harness it all? And what else can we do? The reality is that this has created so much data on the internet that it's becoming the new gold. There's so much data and possibility that new technologies utilizing artificial intelligence and machine learning have been created just to parse through that data to make it actionable. We've seen predictive opportunities such as StatBat from NFL, which predicts the next 
played based on all the previous games played. That's over 50 years of data. We've seen preventative capabilities of tagging endangered species and tracking their movements so we can protect their habitat. We've also gained efficiencies in healthcare and how we should be treating people from surgeries to mental health. It's also become apparent that we need to do things such as exercise and maintain our physical and mental fitness. So let's stop a minute and think about how all that data gets generated. Keep in mind almost everything you do online is generating data. The games you play and how long, the, uh, the posts you like, the videos that you upload. Not only is the data being collected that's tied to you personally based on your phone number or your email address, but it's being retained. Your images, your texts, your videos are all being collected. Now this information is creating ginormous data lakes, all legally obtained through the interaction you have with the internet. Some of these are through software license agreements, which we all read, right? I mean, I know I don't. Some is that free app that you use to share the, your information with your friends, Venmo and other payment platforms that just make things so easy and convenient or all gathering your data as payment for their services, quote unquote, free services, you are the, the cost. So who owns that data? At this point, the company does because you gave them permission to do that. So how do others get access to that data? As stated before, that is the new goal. People are willing to buy it. They're willing to purchase the data with the idea it might come in handy sometime in the future. Marketing a new product based on your previous behavior is big business. Knowing your spending habits, where you travel, is also valuable to certain industries. So let's take a closer look at the potential use of this data. Germany is actually leading the way on data protection. So let's ask ourselves why. It's because Germany has seen the evils of weaponizing that data against their population in the most horrible way. When the Nazis came to absolute power, they used this information against the Jewish population and others they did not consider worthy. So can you imagine if they had the power of the internet or AI or ML? What about the great amount of data that could have been at their disposal? They did everything that they did manually and we have the power to exponentially increase the speed and efficiency of getting through that data. So again, we're not the only ones on the internet doing great things. The NFL previously, it was great to watch what the predictive piece was, but if stat that can predict what the offense is going to do, that's leverage for the defense to go see that and prepare their defense for the offense. Well, then the offense would have to know that the defense might want to do that. And then it becomes this back and forth. But again, just because it's out there doesn't mean people should be using it. Same thing with that predictive, uh, pre preventive with the endangered species. Just as much as you could know where animals are to protect them, poachers and people wanting to do ill good, if they had access to that data, they could also target those animals. And the same thing with that healthcare. If people have access to your healthcare in a way that they can use it against you, maybe if you're not eating the right food, if you're not exercising, how might that come to look at you if health services are lessened, maybe they start getting uh, ra ra rationed out based on performance. So again, usually anything with data and used in a positive light we need to take a look at how it potentially could be used against us as well. Recent data happened in January of this year. The presumed Russian threat actors hacked into the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Ukraine government, and they threatened the people that they have their data and that they're going to release it. Now, what would you do 
if all of your personal data, your personal texts, your videos, those things maybe that you never thought would see the light of day were threatened to be exposed, would you fight back or would you comply? This is gonna be a concern for all of us and it should be. So based on cybersecurity, what is cybersecurity? Most of the time, the answer is that's somebody else's problem. The issue with this is that there's, it's somebody else's responsibility. Cyber does not invoke that I have any responsibility for this. It's not personal. Somebody has to be an expert in order to solve this problem. There's no way I could possibly be able to look at cybersecurity in a way that I would have any input. And I think this is just the wrong message for the public. So that's why I'd like to suggest the term data care. To make cybersecurity synonymous with personal responsibility and also expand the industry much in the same ways in the medical field did with the healthcare. It made it personal. It helped people understand why they should eat better, why they should exercise, why they should see the doctor. Similarly, we need people to understand why they should have cyber hygiene, why they should pay attention to what they're doing online and understand the fields that they're playing in when they're on the internet. So ultimately it comes down to the data. Do you have data online that you would like to have protected? Do you think there's a sense of responsibility for somebody to protect it? That sense of privacy of that data? But who is responsible for its security? We're driving towards more and more technology, more digital enhancements, more things online. Doing your refrigerator, your cars, the way we function, even robots might be on, in our daily lives. So what does that mean for your data, your security, and your privacy? These things should be delivered with security and accountability measures already in place. But we need you to care about your data. It's more than just protecting the data that's out there. How can that be weaponized against you in the future? How can it be manipulated? in ways that provide false information, whether it be positive or negative. We've all seen deep fakes that are amazing with people switching out faces and making them say things that they never said, but to the average person, if you're just taking a glancing look, you're gonna believe what they said and it's not necessarily going to be good. So think of all the videos that you have out there all the times that you've posted, you know, something funny and somebody potentially could take that. Again, it could be positive or it could be negative, but how do we defend against that and try to prove a negative versus defend the positive? So we need politicians to decide policy based on the data and not the technology because the technology is moving so fast. We need the government, insurance agencies, and legal considerations that serve the public in protecting the data and not necessarily just talk about the technology. But we need the public to engage in the conversation and demand the security by design for all things cyber. We need to have in-depth conversations and considerations around the access to the data, the use of the data, but more specifically, the retention of that data. As I said, with a stat that for NFL, they went back 50 years. They have been gathering data for many, many years. But why do we need information that you had when you were 12, 14, 16? Why should that still exist in a data lake of any sorts into the future? Because you can't control what they do with the data, but it's out there. So again, it gets back to who owns that data. So there's not going to be a slowdown of the data. There's not going to be any way that there's people are going to take a pause and say, let's time out on the internet to really figure this out. And it's only going to continue to grow. And there's only going to be others out there figuring out other unique things that they could do to utilize that data. I would argue that most of the intent is for good, but we also have to consider the bad. So what can you do to reduce the data that's out there being produced? 
first, don't blindly cook, click on those accept cookies on websites. You can go to the setting and you could review that and click only the necessary ones. Those marketing cookies, those push information to your cookies, that is gathering additional data that is not required by them or for you to use their sites. Realize that things have the potential to live forever on the internet. And consider that before you post or you write things online or you interact with, with other things. Um, and then discuss data privacy with others. Create clubs, debate it in school and history. The more we talk about it, the more we're gonna understand what's going on and the impact it's having. So that gets me back to the point of data care. Data care really invokes a sense of personal responsibility, whereas cybersecurity doesn't exactly accomplish this in my opinion. We need more people involved in data care. We need more people to understand that it is not somebody else's responsibility. It's very approachable. You can take small steps in order to protect yourself and others on the internet. First, update your software. When you get that a little annoying, hey, update, there's an update for your software, click on it. Don't ignore it. Do it on your phone, do it on your laptop, your computer, what, uh, your iPads. Make sure that that's up to date because vulnerabilities are constantly being discovered and updates are the only way that, well, the general way that they do get um, updated, delivered in order to protect your data. Use a password manager. There are so many simple and free password managers out there. The idea is you need to make it harder for people to get access to your data and you need to make sure there's ways to confirm that there's a person in the middle for this access. And then reboot your device, specifically your phone, frequently. If you can imagine that somebody's listening to your conversation on your phone because you downloaded an app and it backdoored and installed something, a lot of those malware things cannot survive a reboot. So rebooting your phone, believe it or not, is one of the simplest ways to make sure that your information and your privacy is, is retained. Finally, use two-factor authentication or multi-factor authentication. Again, this is an away, a way on the computer, on the internet, to ensure that there's a person in between that access. And keep in mind, that's one of the pillars. It's access and use of your data is going to be important. So data care also informs that social media and technology use. It it's, gives us the context to discuss the why and what we need to do with the information. And it's gonna define our social norms moving forward. So we need to have a deep discussion about this now. And as I said, data care is similar to the term healthcare because it's easy to understand. We chose to specifically leverage a term that was already familiar to the general public and to focus it on the importance of the reason to engage and it's another way to directly invite people to participate. But the data care is the why. Why you need to do these things to protect yourself and your family and your friends. My hope is that when people ask what, my people is hope when they understand why it's important, then they ask what they can do and then do it. So you can take small steps that makes a big difference. We need the public, in particular you students, to pay attention and get in the game. There's such great potential and wondrous things that you're gonna experience and accomplish in your lifetime. The technology at your fingertips is going to allow you to accomplish things much faster and efficiently than we've ever been able to in the past. But as Uncle Ben said to Spider-Man, with great power comes great responsibility. Don't forget this as you advance into the future. Not everyone is out there for the greater good. And don't forget the people behind the data and make a difference. So I'd like to pause there and see if there are any questions. What is a good password manager to use? So that's really great. I personally like LastPass. LastPass and, and OnePass are great because 
you can do it as a single person. So it's generally free if you use a single person, but I have it on my phone and it's connected to my laptop that's like connected to my computer. So I only have to remember one master password and then all of my passwords are remembered. But what I like about these technologies is I can pay a little bit for the year to first security, which is really inexpensive. And I can set up a family plan. So not only can I have my passwords, but I can selectively share my passwords with my husband and with my kids so that they too can have access to the passwords and we don't need to share passwords. The beauty is you don't repeat any password because a lot of the historic data that might be out there that you didn't realize has already has your password and your email connected. And if you continue to use those passwords, the likelihood of you being able to expose your data in a lot of your other accounts is so much easier. So it does, they've done so much to make a password manager instantaneous that please do all you can in order to get a password manager. So are there any laws maybe out there about what companies can do with your data or maybe laws that should be, we should work on, you know, being enacted or anything like that? Absolutely. And that's where I really wanted to point out what Germany has been doing. The GDPR basically is outlining the right to be forgotten. So if you can imagine you sign up for a website because you wanted to buy the new I don't even know what game you would want to buy today. And it was a one-time purchase that you were going to make for that. You sign up, you buy it, everything goes well. Well, that company then potentially would sell their data, your data to someone else. And then they might sell that data to someone else. And so you can imagine the bouncing ball that it's not one single place that your data exists. So the idea that the onus is now put on that company that originally got your data, that they are somewhat responsible to then know who they pass the data to. And if anybody else passes that data to somebody else. So that GDPR really is positive and detrimental at the same time because interacting internationally, that's a German law. Most of us in cybersecurity and, and um, enterprise business transact internationally. However, if I'm a dentist in the United States, I don't have that protection. So those type of rollouts of certain laws and seeing how that they're being implement, uh, implemented and, and accepted are being looked at by the United States and other countries to then try to implement. But this is exactly my point. We need more conversations. We need more discussion. We need people to understand that this is not tomorrow's conversation. It's yesterday's conversation that we're now trying to catch up and play to get implemented today. That would be really hard, I think, to track. Like, let's say if you're sharing your information with many, many different companies, wouldn't a company be able to say, well, like, oh, well, you know, that they didn't get that from us. It's probably from somebody else. You know, uh, I feel like the, there's a lot of, uh, I guess, uh, what's the word? Lawlessness there. There you go. Yeah. I, I jokingly say the WWW on the internet is the wild, wild west. <laughs> However, that then goes to this retention piece. If there's data that's been out there for five to six years, why? get rid of it, delete it. Like there shouldn't be a reason that it stays around that long. My, my email address that I used to use on AOL, that probably still living out there somewhere. Why? It's showing no value to anybody, yet people love their data, it's gold, and they don't want to get rid of it. So there definitely has to be considerations and conversations for that specific point. The cat is out of the bag. So how do we catch it and, and, and move forward? And part of that is, is it an archive that an official archive that we agree that, in, that can hold this data, but everybody else has to delete their data? I hope so. 
you know, that's, that's kind of the, that's why this conversation needs to be happening. Is it supposed to be gold medal is for computers and cell phones or gold not medal. really, really understand the question? Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure exactly how that's um, supposed to be perceived as a, a question either. Can you clarify but, for us? Wait. <laughs> I don't know if it's a product. There are so many products out there as well. So the, the sea of information to maintain and manage is outrageous. And, and there's a couple things as far as data privacy of which you should be aware. TikTok, you post your, your video on there and you try to share it with your friends. Everything you put on there is going to China. Do you think China has the capability and ability to farm and host and, and harvest that information? They sure do. They have a lot of capabilities on that. So those free apps where they're trying to, you know, change your hair and it's your face and you're interacting with it, there's a lot of data that you're allowing to, to be exposed that people are just not aware that it just seems like it's fun and it's free, but they're serious out of privacy ramifications that should be considered with a lot of those particular apps. I hadn't thought about that type of application there, Cindy, about the, the ones where you can try on makeup and stuff, I believe is one of those big things. And that kind of ties into another, I guess, vocab question. Um, you mentioned ML and AI, and I just want to make sure everybody is kind of aware what those abbreviations mean. Yeah, so artificial intelligence is the pie in the sky, Terminator robots being able to act and interact on their own, that they learn and they, they become artificially intelligent. We are not there yet. So even when you hear the hype of artificial intelligence, it's really machine learning. And when we have machine learning, we have to train the machine to d- digest the data and, and to pick through the data. And one of the considerations with machine learning um, that we're noticing is there's an inherent bias when we train data. For instance, if data came from China and I tried to train machine learning algorithm to go through that data and I use Western terms such as, you know, common Western terms, potentially Christmas, potentially I'm I'm not coming up with words, but it just doesn't translate to how they operate in their culture. So culturally, my my algorithm might not train correctly, and therefore the information that I get out of my data won't either. And, And it's interesting to make sure that the bias out of any type of data mining and things is actually removed because there's a lot of times that we're trying to rely on this data, yet it's tainted. And once data is tainted, you, it, the trust is gone. Yeah, I could kind of see how you could use even like slang or terms that only certain people from generations use to even like group people, you know, and sort them out. You could figure out who they are. So that's yeah. kind of scary. <laughs> So again, it's, it's a big, big problem, but we need to, to address it now. I mean, it's not an unsolvable issue, but we all do need to get into the game and we need to participate together. Um, you mentioned a lot of great things we could do online, including not sharing all the cookie information. That's really burdensome to do that for every website, Cindy. Yes, <laughs> but, but before there was no option for, to turn those off. So as far as the laws, what laws can we enact? We should be able to have them off by default and only turn them on when we want them. And if we can get that shifted balance again, if I want to be tracked because I do like a particular type of makeup and I want them to be able to send me things and show me things that are very similar, which is what the marketing agreement industry is trying to say, and they're trying to enable, they want to make your surfing more uh, like-minded. When you go to Netflix and they say, oh, you watch this. So how about watch this? You might like this as well. Sometimes that's very beneficial. 
So there are times that you want to opt in, but right now the onus is on the public to opt out. No, we should opt in. The idea of cybersecurity, you probably hear it. Oh, we need so many more people. We need more people. We don't have enough. This industry is so wonderful. I mean, the mission and the people are so passionate about trying to get people into cybersecurity. But if you're one of those people where cybersecurity is not resonating with you, if you're not feeling it, if you don't see yourself with taking the entire world, putting it on your back and walking in your hoodie alone in your basement, and that's what your perception of what cybersecurity is, it is absolutely not. Everything you do is a team sport. You're always working with other people. You're learning other things. There's, there's not one cybersecurity thing. There's, it's like being a doctor, like saying, oh, a doctor is one thing. But if you had a problem with your, your teeth, you wouldn't go see a foot doctor. It's the same thing with cybersecurity. We have forensics. We have data scientists, again, digging through all of that data to make sense of it. We have offensive people trying to make sure that we are securing different things, but we have defense as well, trying to make sure you're protected. And so the defense is called blue teams. The offense is called red teams. Well, there's purple teams because you got to do both. Just like when you play soccer, you don't just get to play one side of it. You have to perform well on both. So just if you're interested at all about protecting your data, even just yourself or your family, look at some of these courses, look at some of these careers, look at some of these things just so you're better informed. And then I would almost guarantee it's going to be so interesting that you'll be like, oh, I want to learn more, learn more, learn more. So I really would just challenge everybody to take a look at at least one course. Thank you again. Have a wonderful day and a wonderful week, everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you. 